Hi everyone and welcome back to the HP Leader YouTube channel and our fabulous day today talking all things cardiorespiratory rehabilitation and this is the third session um, and I'm delighted to welcome Heather. Another disclosure, I do work with Heather, she's our amazing cardiac rehab lead and her and the team have done a phenomenal job to keep rehabilitation going during the COVID-19 pandemic in a variety of platforms Heather mm -hmm. so I'm not going to steal your time anymore I'm going to hand over to you to share your slides mm -hmm. and also introduce you formally and, and where you're from thank you hi thank you for that um can you see the slides perfectly yes lovely thank you okay so I'm going to be talking about face-to-face -face, um group exercise now um I do work in cardiac rehab but we, myself and Karen, who you'd have met before the break, have worked very closely um, risk assessments, SOPs. There's lots of overlap there. So I've, we've also had a discussion to pull in what's relevant for both services there. The things I'd like to cover are the kind of patients that we include in our face-to-face -face service. because It's not suitable for everyone, but for some it's invaluable. We also need to look at how we keep staff safe in running face-to-face -face services. And alongside that, we also need to most importantly keep the patients nice and safe. A few things for you to consider as we're going through this information though, this is all relevant to what's happening within our trust based on the guidance we have to follow, um, guidance we've had from different resources. So you do need to bear this in mind along with sort of your own local guidance there. Um, if you're running an acute versus community service, they may well be a difference, and we run both of those. So where I can, I'll pull that into the talk. As has been said earlier, if you're working in community venues, they each will have their own plans in place with regards to COVID and when we're there and when we're actually running things from their venues, we must make sure that we're following their guidelines as well. Local NHS, governmental guidelines, more local guidelines, it differs so much, particularly over these last few weeks we've seen with lockdowns in different countries, within different regions. You might be watching this internationally, so do bear in mind the guidance that you're subject to. And certainly talking to the infection control teams and the resus teams has been invaluable to make sure we're really offering patients a good level of service and we're sort of meeting all the requirements that we need to for their safety and hours. Another thing I would state before we go into sort of their hows and whys is educating the patients and their expectations. If they know in advance what to expect, you're spending far much time with that face-to-face -face intervention, re-explaining things, and they do need to be kept as short as possible, as Karen said previously. Um, we're in the process of trying to sort of like film little bits of the process, just so patients know what to expect. They understand when we say we're wearing PPE, they know what that entails, and they're much better prepared, and that cuts down on the question inside. And certainly when we do our initial assessment, start again, initial assessment, which is always virtual over attend anywhere, we will make sure they know exactly what's involved before they actually set foot in the hospital or in the community venues and reiterating sort of the risk assessment for staff and patients is so important. So probably a strange thing to say when I'm here talking to you about face-to-face -face rehab. Um, it says cardiac, it's very sort of, um, across the board, it could be through other forms of rehab. We will get patients exercising virtually by default. Um, as we know though, not all patients are able to engage with virtual options, which is why it's so important to have a menu of options make sure patients have a comparable level of service, even if they haven't got sort of computers, um, laptops, internet connections, or maybe just the skills to use them. Um, the people that obviously need to be able and happy to attend face-to-face -face sessions, if they had a long journey by public transport, that would be a consideration. Um, the sort of patients that we invite to our face-to-face -face are predominantly the people that can't engage with our virtual services, which are held in group sessions on Microsoft Teams. We have had people who have tried their best to interact and they've had problems with their internet connection. It's cutting out quite regularly. And from a safety perspective, it's much safer. We see them in front of us exercising rather than continually losing connection and not being able to see them from that point of view. As you may have heard Karen say earlier, under the assessment side, they must have sort of an able-bodied responsible adult at home. 
So if there is an emergency, we have somebody on site, we would have obviously um, a link with them virtually, but if that's cut out, we do need to make sure there's somebody there for safety. So some of our patients, if family are out working during the day, there's nobody available, then they could come in and they could still do rehab and not miss out on the service. Patients who have maybe potentially increased comorbidities, um, balance challenges, you'd have to risk assess on the individual as to the appropriateness, but you may feel it's safer seeing them face to face. And one screening tool that certainly um, my colleague in Pomni Rehab spoke about was the easy assessment tool. And that sort of gives some indication as to who may or may not be appropriate. The other group we've had that we have offered face-to-face -face patients who've got significant anxiety and just do not have the confidence and would not interact with virtual um, cardiac rehab. We've had a few referred from other programmes who maybe are offering virtual and they've recognised the need for face-to-face -face and getting patients in, feeling they're closely monitored, has actually helped the anxiety in some cases potentially to a level they could then continue to interact virtually. But it can be sort of quite frightening, particularly if people have got lots of anxieties after their event. So with regards to protecting staff, then as we've mentioned earlier today, really important that every staff has an individual risk assessment. Um, that may be done with managers, occupational health, it may be different in each organisation. And based on that, we'll give you an indication of who could work within the face-to-face -face services and with appropriate PP, that would be large portions of the team. You can see a picture of one of my colleagues here and from our point of view and the reasoning behind the level of PP we wear I'm coming on to, but in all of our face-to-face -face interactions we would have a surgical mask, a visor, apron and gloves um, and we'll have a bit more of a discussion about that later. As I said earlier, really important to consult with infection control, making sure things are safe as possible for both staff and patients. We're minimising patient contact wherever, so lots more have been done verbally rather than hands-on adjustments, potentially we may have relied on more before. We work on a named instructor approach as well, so if we have six patients with us in a face-to-face -face setting, two members of staff, in that situation we'd split them three and three, so we're only interacting with three patients rather than six different patients, and as well as that we would be making sure that patients only had one of us interacting rather than two, unless an emergency more hands were required, because then it just cuts down those sort of links, but they would be distancing wherever possible there. In some centres, there'll be asymptomatic testing for staff, which is something that's commencing with us next week. So that's something as well, which would help protect the staff, but equally the patients from that, obviously. And knowing your zone, which is what I've got a slide on next. So. In our trust, there's a policy in place regarding patients' risk and what makes them either high, low or moderate risk. And in both our community setting and our acute hospital setting, we come, our patients all class as moderate risk around the pathway. The reason for that being that we triage patients, and I'm going to come into that shortly. We check patients asymptomatic before they come and see us. We check they've not had contacts with anybody who has been positive or suspected, then we recheck that at intervals, but they haven't actually had a COVID test. So this makes them moderate risk. That impacts for us on the PPE that we need to wear, which is why we have the mask, visor, apron and gloves throughout our sessions. Um, the mask and visor are per session. However, if there's any soiling or anything, that could be changed. Um, and again, gloves and apron is per patient interaction, which does have an impact because if we've had to go into a patient's pod, interact with them sort of at closer proximity for as less time as possible, we're then having to come out, change, take our apron and gloves off, re-sanitise our hands and then another set of apron and gloves. You can get through a few sets of PP per session. Resus is the other factor that impacts with our patients being moderate risk. And I'm going to come on to a sort of a, um, algorithm for that shortly. So protecting patients, so important. We know the benefits of face-to-face -face rehab, whether that be cardiac, pulmonary or other forms of rehab, but we need to make sure that they're safe. The challenge for us is if you've got an outpatient service where maybe patients come once every few months, they do a screen before that appointment and then they carry on for the rest of the time. 
some of these patients we're seeing sort of twice a week for eight weeks. So this is happening up to sort of 16 times over an eight week period. So it does have an impact on the surface service, making sure that you're able to do this all for safety. Um, so obviously the patient and our safety is paramount, but we do need to factor this into our sort of work schedules. So all patients will do a COVID questionnaire normally on the morning of their appointment. However, if their appointment's really early around the eight o'clock mark, we may do this the evening before, but then they have to report to us and stay at home should symptoms change between then and arrival. Um, on the right, I'm just going to attempt to move this without breaking anything. There's a copy of the COVID questionnaire that we have to do within our trust. Your trust probably has its own version, but they look at very similar things. They're looking at a temperature over 37, 8 with any of those symptoms. And it's all over the last 14 days for the period asking the patients more tired and they may answer yes for these purely because of their health condition so that's where the clinical judgment comes in is it potentially covid is it just that normal for that patient we ask about muscle aches and pains taste and smell dmv also about any sort of contact within their families or wider networks are they extremely vulnerable and yeah have they had any contacts with anyone that has tested positive and in the last week or two, we've had to ask about any visits to Denmark in the last 14 days, either themselves or anybody else that they have had contact with. Once that's done, we then do a temperature check as they arrive at the venue, whether that be the hospital or whether that be in the community. We recheck their symptoms at that point in time because we need to make sure nothing's changed. There may be no okay last night or eight o'clock in the morning, but time's passed in between. We need to make sure nothing's changed. We try and limit patients and literally only have the patient. They don't bring anybody with them. There's very, very few exceptions where we would have to have somebody with that patient. Um, and if that was the case, we also screen the patient with a questionnaire and we also do a temperature check. One example, um, as I said, it is very, very rare. We have a gentleman with a total artificial heart that has to have a trained carer. So we have to do a screen for that gentleman as well every single session. For the patients, we have some sort of ground rules as such, if you want to call them that, um, that they must agree to follow to partake in these services. So unless it's a very exceptional reason, then they must agree to attend alone. They bring their own water. We're not providing water for them. Bring in minimal personal items. We don't want patients turning up with large suitcases, um, looking like they're going to be staying for several weeks, just the bare minimum. So wallet, keys, phone, coat because obviously we're approaching winter time if we're not here already on some days so really being in as minimal as possible and that all goes into their little pod to make sure that everything is contained we have signage in the venues they must agree to follow that and the rules that we have they must let us know if symptoms change at any point before the fact they turn up they need to know as well the session is kept as short as possible for their safety so some patients after face-to-face -face class I'm sure you've all had in the past people start to ask questions and they're there sort of like 20 30 40 minutes later they're enjoying this of the social interaction amongst other things and if the questions aren't urgent we would then sort of send the patient away and phone them and have that conversation remotely just to increase safety because obviously we do try and keep things to an hour just for minimizing this and they must agree to sort of follow not only our PPE requirements, but also the social distance inside of things. And patients have been brilliant. They're just so grateful for sort of assistance and support and their recovery. Um, we've been very lucky. With regards to the venue, then, as I said earlier, all venues will have their own risk assessment. Patients, we get to sort of enter one at a time. If it's at a smaller class, it's dependent where we are from the car park, then they're waiting their cars and we'll let them in when appropriate. Or if we're a distance in the car park, they have to make sure they wait two metres apart, not so they're chatting, having mothers meeting while they're waiting. And we do say don't come too early, they need to be there on time, but we don't want them hanging around for a long time before that appointment. So it's the one way system, as we said. For ventilation, we'll have all the windows and doors open. We're lucky in our venues that we can get very good ventilation. Um, and that's something which has helped us certainly. If it's a shared venue in the community, then that's something certainly to consider. Can things be run safely? We're lucky that when we hire the venues, we're the only people there. And even luckier that our venues have agreed to stay open during the current lockdown for our sole use patients, which we're really grateful for as other patients. 
the social distancing, it's keeping patients far enough away for safety. Then we've got a pod system for that, as have other services that I've heard of running face to face. And I'll show you some pictures of that. We keep everyone in their little area, either in our gym or in the community. And my pulmonary colleagues also have like a walk circuit, but that's kept well away from everyone else. Everyone is fully socially distanced. There's no touching of anything. There's just literally cones. And it's all done in a way that's safe for the patients whilst getting them the benefits that we need. This picture here on the right of the screen here is the gym that I work in at the hospital. On the floor, you can see, yeah, so here we've got some hazard tape down. Everything is sort of marked out. With everything, it's always like this two metre gap for safety and because of the size of the equipment, we've actually gone two and a half metres because patients need space. And it has involved redesigning the service we offered. Before we had a circuit, patients moved around the gym. Now they turn up, they go in that pod, their monitoring's in the pod, warm up, cool down, exercise all in the pod. And then the, sort of like the cool down, relaxation and monitoring again, all happens in that little area. There's one way systems in place. So should halfway through, we try and say, use the toilet before you leave home to minimize the need. If they do need the toilet, they have to follow the one-way system out and then coming back in to the safety of everybody that's there. We've designed the pods that the bikes are all on the left of the pod. So when they're on the bikes, they're all an equal distance apart. They have another item of CV kit. So that's all on the right of their pod. And then anything more aerobic they're doing in the centre to make sure we always maintain that space in. In the community, we have a chair and sometimes cones marking out where the little pods are. In the community because of space in reality they're probably three meters absolute minimum apart there with regards to pods it's really important you record which pod patients are in so if a patient later turned out to be positive and due to the time frame needed to contact patients via track and trace we need to know exactly which instructors were in the class but also where patients were so if patient three suddenly test positive patient one and four being so far apart we know there's sort of no risk there if everything's been followed appropriately and because of our distance and even the closer pod but we always record which pod the patient's in um, we split the patients between the staff to make sure there's not two staff interacting with the same patient and this emergency as I said everything needed for the exercise is within that pod so weights that can be thoroughly cleaned afterwards the monitoring so sats probes blood pressure monitors chairs Everything is in that pod that's needed. Everything is verbal guidance as much as possible and everything needs to be wipeable. So things like chairs, you can have material chairs. You need to make sure they're sort of um, fully wipeable with the sort of infection control guidance. With regards to PPE for patients, there's some mixed thoughts, but certainly there's a lot of evidence out there as to sort of face masks now, looking at sort of um, droplet things like that and risk with regards to that and I've got some references coming up people can have a look at at their leisure with us the agreement between ourselves management and infection control is patients will turn up and they'll be given a fresh face mask so when patients come along if they've got their own mask we have little um empty sort of takeaway containers that they put their mask in and seal it so it goes in their pod rather than laying around if they've got a surgical mask, we don't know. Have they used that same mask multiple occasions over the past few weeks or is it fresh that morning? So to make sure for safety, we give them a fresh mask on arrival. There's different advice regarding face masks for exercise. With us, patients do wear masks with the exercise and we've had no problems with that. Um, there's some guidance coming up, which I'll share with you in a moment. Some of the guidance says if patients are wearing face masks, you need to monitor their pods more closely, but we would have done that anyway. And certainly with the patients we've had, we've not had problems with the heart rate monitoring. We don't traditionally monitor SATs in cardiac rehab, but because we can't use our heart rate bands and we use SATs probes, we do have their SATs. And again, we've had no problems with that at all. Um, the guidance would be obviously just the prescription if that was the case. Some centres offer visors, some don't. We do offer patients a visor if they wish to wear that on top of their mask. And probably on overall, about 50% of patients are happy wearing that and wear that during exercise. Um, we have our kajel everywhere as you enter the venues, whether that be hospital or community, within each pod, um, on leaving, outside the bathroom. So plenty of opportunities for patients to do that for hand hygiene. If they've 
breathe, breathing quite deeply and they feel their mask stamp, then we can provide a new mask as they leave. These are some of the references there, which you might need to sort of capture either by photo or later on on the sort of YouTube channel. The one I'm going to focus on at the moment is the AACDPR one, which is mentioned earlier by Sue, looking about resuming cardiac and pulmonary rehab programmes. So within their guidance, under the infection control procedure there, they're saying patients must be using masks appropriately, so covering the nose and mouth. I mean, we've all walked around in the community and see people with masks sitting over people's chins, which isn't really going to achieve much, as we know. They also say that the masks must be replaced at appropriate time frames, which is something that we do within the service. So they say some institutions maybe sort of suggest masks and gloves. We don't personally suggest gloves, but there's the alcohol gel there, so that negates that need. Um, they talk about fresh masks, which is something that we do, and also, if necessary, adjusting the exercise prescription. So it's just monitoring the patients as we do anyway, and if we do need to make any alterations from that point of view. With regards to resus, hopefully, and I'm touching wood as I say this to you, not something that we actually need to utilise. However, we must always be prepared for the unexpected and make sure we have procedures in place. Um, basically, because I said we're sort of a medium risk area for patients because there's no official COVID test, though we do screen them thoroughly. So based on that, there are implications for resuscitation. Certainly very early on um, in the first lockdown, the guidance coming out of Resus UK was that full PPE before CPR and um, further intervention was started. That has since changed and CPR now isn't considered aerosol generating. So CPR could be started immediately if required. We would be in our level two PPE anyway in the community or within the hospital. And a member of the team could start CPR if indicated, whilst the other members of the team would on in higher level PPE. Um, based on the guidance we have here, then we would, in the event of an arrest, we would need this, the full um, fluid resistant gowns we would have to wear. And also we would have to change our face mask to our high grade face mask to make sure that we're still protected from the patient before using the BMV, so the bag mask valve, um, just to protect ourselves really and any sort of member of the team sort of come in sort of crash team in the hospital we have signage around indicating the level and we would have spare kit for the patient well for the staff um, on the crash trolley within our hospital setting and in the emergency bag in the community so we have the kit there if required but touch wood um, just to look pretty and not be needed we hope few things in summary really I want to sort of reiterate so we know that obviously face-to-face -face is going to have higher risks than virtual however if it's done in the right way we can minimize these risks while still gaining the benefit for the patients so you're going to hear probably the word risk assessment so many times today that's really important to make sure we're protecting the staff and the patients so in offering the care patients are protected and in attending the patients are protected Risk assessments and SOPs for all things, and there is quite a lot of overlap in certainly at Harefield. That's been done jointly with cardiac and pulmonary rehab, as Rachel alluded to earlier. And I believe they will be available um, when we found a system for sharing it to save over 800 emails. Um, it's balancing. We need to look at the risk of the patient attending face to face versus the risk if they're not able to engage in rehab, because the evidence base is there, both cardiac and pulmonary rehab and other rehabs as well. So we really do need to make sure that patients aren't getting a substandard level of care just because they can't interact with our virtual services. It's sort of really getting that comparable level of service for all patients. It's really important to prepare patients in advance of that appointment. So as much as can be done virtually is done virtually, whether that's by video link, whether that's via a telephone, the better prepared they are, then that will cut down a lot of the explanations, which is what takes the time. And that's for face-to-face -face assessments as well as the classes. Um, and really it's about having a menu option but for patients. We know obviously most services ran face-to-face -face prior to the current time. And at the moment, obviously, we've had to sort of adapt totally, but we want to make sure we've got options to cover all patients really. 
um, in cardiac rehab 50% didn't take rehab up before. So that's something that hopefully we can now help to improve on with virtual and making sure that we're sort of offering patients a good level of care um, and then just some contact details at the end. Good resources certainly on the cardiac side would be the ACPICR and the ACPR um, who are both on Twitter there. And any queries myself or Karen, as Rachel said, then obviously um, you can get in touch with myself. And I'll pass them over to Karen. <laughs> Thanks, Heather, and thank you for being bang on time. We do have a couple of questions coming in. First of all, what space are you giving each patient on their exercise station? So um, that varies partly due to venue and layouts. In the hospital, it's sort of an old ward setting, so it's like a long, thin um, area there. Each pod, we were told we needed two metres for safety, but because of the size of the kit, when you've got bikes and treadmills, we've actually gone two and a half metres to make sure there's still enough space for them to exercise. So sort of side to side, the closest they'd be would be two and a half metres to the next patient. In the community, we were working along the same sort of guidance. But to be honest, because of the space we're in, in reality, it's probably a minimum of three metres, maybe even four in some directions. So and that would be side to side and front to back. Thank you. And if a patient has becomes a contact during their rehab and miss classes, do they rejoin another group once they've stopped isolating? Um, just one comment from Maria says they have such a long waiting list, not sure what to do if this happens. Yeah, I mean, with patients, ideally we try and keep the groups the same. So it's the same patients attending, but the same as we had prior to sort of COVID really, patients do miss appointments because they have to go for their hospital follow-up or at the moment they probably need to sit on a video link with their consultant or nurse specialist. They may miss, um, particularly some of the parents, the patients we've got that have children, they have to sort of isolate because the children are in that predicament and they need to be there. So they will join and they'll re get those sessions back. They'll join as soon as they can um, and continue so they don't miss out on those sessions because it's not their fault and it's the world we're all living in staff and patients they would get those sessions back definitely and because we've got the virtual and the face to face we can juggle things a little bit to help with our waiting lists as well so we can get people started pretty quickly which is really good thank you and there's a lot of comments around that just i think you give people the approval almost to say having that fluid approach being able to adapt because there will be a third wave and a fourth wave mm -hmm. and potentially more lockdowns as we've mentioned in the other presentations you know once Boris said the NHS is open and yeah. it really just it really just consolidates and confirms how important cardiac mm -hmm. pulmonary rehab is all rehab but with the commission services you know innovation's great but we need we know we do need to default to what we know mm -hmm. works alongside that providing this yeah. venue based approach like you said that we're going to hear more about so lots of comments just thanking you for that and um, Vicky did share something about having a um, plastic box for patients belongings and coats mm -hmm. in rehab and so it mm -hmm. keeps things off the floor and they can lean off yeah. them containing it definitely and what obviously thorough disinfectant yeah definitely that's a very good idea so um so I love some of the comments coming through on the chat um so just a final question from Ursula how do you restart a patient who's become a contact um in the same cohort how do you get back the sessions mixed missed I think you kind of touched on that but I mean the way we run the rehab um we have a sort of a set structure how we're going to run it obviously they're warming up and cooling down now having to be on machines in the hospital the individual ex the exercises they're doing, although there's a set exercise list patients do, it's individualised per person. So they would restart at the level that was appropriate for them when they actually start back in the session. They're not having to sort of play catch up. They just start back at the level they are, which may be the same. It may have decreased. So, yeah, we basically sort of individualise it per person for every attendance. Fabulous. And the final point, what's your experience with Attend Anywhere? <laughs> I'm laughing because it's so variable <laughs> amongst people. It's, I mean, we use it for all of our initial assessments. Anything that can be done virtual will be because, I mean, 
I find it much better than the telephone. How many times have you been on the phone in the paper that says, oh, I've got a pain here. Well, I can't see down a telephone. We're good, but we're not that good. So it, you can actually see on a video the number of times within the first couple of minutes of introducing myself, patients, male and female, are lifting their shirt. They're showing me their scars. Patients feel they've actually had a proper interaction. If they can see who they're talking to, I think it's actually safer. Not everyone can do it, so we use the phone. But when it's when patients can, definitely would use that. But not for group classes. You can't get more than three, we found, safely with a pen anywhere. We use Teams for that. Well, Heather, thank you so much. I know you're more than happy to be contacted on Twitter, um, and I'm sure you'll interact with people. You are an expert in this area, so we are so glad and so grateful you've shared your experiences. Thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank now, you. I'm delighted our next speaker is here bang on time, so thanks very much, Savon. Um, I know we're being joined by Michael, who's just looking like he's trying to get into the room. But if you wouldn't mind just starting off by sharing your slides and also introducing yourself and what you're going to be talking about, I'm sure he will join us. Thank you so much. We can see those perfectly. Thank you. Right. Hi, my name's Siobhan Hollier. I'm um, a clinical specialist respiratory physiotherapist with um, BOC Healthcare and I'm the senior team lead that leads the services in the east of England and um, northeast of England um, for us. Um, Michael is my colleague that's going to talk with us today as well um, and he's our clinical specialist respiratory physiotherapist um, in their east coast which is um, kind of Norfolk, Suffolk. Okay, so um, Rachel's kindly asked us to talk about um, our COVID-19 um, virtual programme that we've rolled out. So um, early on in lockdown, we realised very quickly that we were probably going to be um, not able to deliver face to face for some time. So we spent the first two weeks really to the end of March trying to um, design a, a pathway that would allow us to get going with something for patients as soon as possible because obviously like everybody we had patients that um, their program had just suddenly stopped abruptly because of lockdown um, and needed to complete and also those that were still on the waiting list so um, we um, we managed to get something up and running quite quickly at the start of April. So what I'm gonna take you through today um, is just an overview of the programme that we've delivered so far. And it is a very um, evolving programme. It does change all the time. Um, some of the safety things that we considered while we were um, implementing that and what strategies we put into place, some of the challenges that we've we found along the way and also some of our, out, our outcomes. So um, one of the benefits of being um, a, a company that delivers across lots of different services is that um, we can put, we can gather quite large numbers of um, patients and look at their data um, quite easily compared to sort of small localized services. So um, we'll share some of that with you as well. So just giving you a bit of an overview of our programme. Um, so there's the pre-assessment phase, which um, the first part is not much different to what it was pre-lockdown. And I'm sure it's the same for every service that where we would triage the patient. So triage the patient referral coming in, um, gather additional information if we need to from either the referrers or the GP. So potentially sourcing extra things like ECGs, echoes, um, anything that might enhance our picture of that patient before we see them. Um, we also have a pre-call, um, which was part of our evolution. We didn't originally have that in the first few weeks, um, but we have a pre-call to patients um, to actually see whether they're interested in doing it and to explain what the virtual offering is all about. Um, we introduced that because we found on reflection that just booking patients straight into an initial assessment and sending them a letter, telling them that they were gonna get a phone call led to quite high um, kind of problems with 
not being able to get hold of the patient on the phone at the time um, and also quite a lot of clinician time spent just trying to sell it and then getting a no so we put the prequel in because that could be done by the um, assistants or technical instructors um, at least we knew then when we were making the phone calls to patients the patients were already engaged and, and wanting to do the program so um, the assessment process is a telephone initial assessment um, early on we didn't have the option of video um, so we had to go through we had to go for the telephone option we have got video options now but we have actually stayed with a telephone initial assessment purely because it was quite kind of hard from a logistical point of view for a clinician to be on system one and to be doing notes in a timely manner um, and going through the assessment process with the patient whilst um, whilst being sort of engaged over video so um, we've stuck we've stuck with it on telephone for the moment um, we also do our initial outcomes at that session. So we do um, a one minute sit to stand test, PHQ-9 and GAD-7, CAT, and um, we've also introduced some other measures which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, they then have session one. Um, initially, these were by telephone only, but as we've evolved, we now offer them as either telephone or video session. So patients are asked oh, that initial time spent. Sorry, patients are asked on that initial call um, if they would have a preference for either one. Um, and obviously that helps us to gauge how um, internet literate some of the patients are and whether they'd be able to cope with, with having video. Um, there's a um, discussion of safety information and intensity expectations as well on that first session. And that's probably a, a large part of that first call. And then it's about developing the individualized exercise prescription with the patient going through, if we're on video, we demonstrate the exercises. Um, if it's on telephone, it's a, an explanation of kind of the safety points around the exercises and how to do them correctly. So we set up that individualized program with the patient. Um, again, it's about thinking about what equipment they've got at home, what we can use around the house, how we can safely deliver it in their, their home and tailor it to that patient. And then they'll also get an overview of um, the education, how that's going to work and be sort of walked through the monitoring paperwork that we're going to do with them. So our programme, we don't actually do the exercises with the patient. You can imagine that um, unlike group settings, if you had to go through every single patient's um, exercises with them at the time of a call, you're not going to get through many patients in a week because that's going to take a considerable amount of time. Um, and in terms of time that we're devoting to, to these points already, the assessments are probably averaging about an hour. And the um, first sessions, again, are probably um, between half an hour and an hour, depending on the patient. So um, sessions two to 12, um, these are, tend to be conducted by our technical instructors or exercise physiologists within the team. And um, these involve exercise reviews um, on, on a twice weekly basis and a progression of the programme. So reflecting on what the patient's been able to do, where they've got to, what they've recorded in their charts, and then obviously progressing those, those on. Um, and then we also cover... Um, education topics on a one-to-one -one basis obviously they're perhaps not as comprehensive as we were doing rehab but you could argue they're also more individually tailored to the patient because you can pick up on specific needs that you might not be able to pick up on in a, in a group session. Um, we then have a discharge assessment at the end where we're re repeating the outcomes, reviewing goals and looking at those ongoing individualized exercise plans. Um, post Post-discharge assessment, patients are then sent their satisfaction surveys, um, outcome letters go to referrals as normal. We're not actually discharging them at the moment. We decided that um, because patients are not necessarily getting the full gold standard rehab for which they were referred, that we would put them on a 12-month recall, which we had, we had to agree, obviously, with the commissioners. 
so that um, they could be then offered hopefully face to face down the line and that they wouldn't kind of lose that opportunity. So that's the overview. In terms of evolution, um, when we planned it originally, we had planned to try and do as much virtually as we could. So using emails rather than sending out posts. Um, and that was just because of logistics around our admin staff not necessarily being able to get into offices and us having to use um, kind of a postal service off site. So we then hit a, a brick wall quite early on with that around IG and um, security of sending patient identifiable information out through email to non-secure emails. So um, we had to pull back on that and only use it um, for additional information down the line, not things like appointment letters. Um, as I said, we introduced the pre-calls in May as a result of staff feedback. We have transitioned. We, um, we now have um, video accurate for um, first session and follow-up sessions. And there are a number of patients now that have opted to have those, um, but not as many as we perhaps thought initially would. We've also filmed some exercise safety videos. Um, they are just going through their final ratification to go up onto our YouTube site. Um, but the idea of those is that patients will then be able to um, see how to do those exercises correctly. There's warm up and cool down one. Um, and then that is sort of, it, again, it's not taking them through the entire program, but it's about showing them how to do them safely and to show them progressions as well. Um, we're just about to roll out with um, MS Teams group sessions. We're just about to pilot that in a couple of areas of the country. And also like everyone else, also thinking about our planning, our recovery to, to face to face. So, <coughs> excuse me. So existing safety measures that we've got, um, obviously as part of triage, you're thinking about all those safety things that might pop up on the referral anyway. And you're already looking into, um, <coughs> sorry, you're already looking into things like any cardiac problems that might flag up that you want more information on, any musculoskeletal issues, those kind of things. You're, we have usually recent OBS on the referral forms and um, we also have system one. So that allows us to do the sharing agreement with the GPs in most areas so we can see up-to-date information on there. Then we would routinely use force screening. <coughs> so that hopefully will pick up on any balance issues, any concerns around that. We, we need to make sure we've got up-to-date next of kin information. And um, we also normally would routinely send out quite clear instructions about exercise intensity, how to use Borg and RP and things like that. So, sorry, I've got a real tickle today. Um, we normally also have local service catch-ups and service meetings and supervision and things like that on a local level and obviously our normal clinical governance structure to flag up any safety issues. So additional things that we've introduced <coughs> where possible, quite a lot of the patients will have their own equipment we found so we can take OBS from them. That is probably one of the, um, the most contentious issues we've had in introducing it around whether or not we should be taking routine OBS um, and we're not able to send out equipment to patients if they don't have stuff. So um, I think very early on that that caused a lot of debate amongst clinicians and I know it has on a much wider scale as well. Um, but it's I think I remember seeing something with Sally Singh quite early on where she was saying about the risk to these patients if we don't do something with them versus that um, element of trying to check off to make sure absolutely everything is okay when actually these patients would otherwise be walking around and doing things at home on their own anyway. Um, we have put out a safety disclaimer. <coughs> Sorry. Um, we also um, introduced the clinical frailty scale to perhaps pick up on those that might struggle more with an unsupervised home program. We have enhanced our exercise safety sheets um, obviously, we also have twice weekly calls, which means it's a very short gap between contacting patients um, if there is going to be any problems. 
The other thing we did, which was very useful, is introduce clinical supervision and best practice on a much wider scale, scale across the company. So instead of just our small local services, we brought all our services into that. So for PR um, and and cardiac rehab, that's about 10 services spread across the UK, everywhere from Somerset, Newcastle um, to Norfolk. So <coughs> um, we, um, we use those forums to discuss particularly tricky cases where we're not sure whether patients should go through, um, you know, if, if there's any sort of challenges um, that we're having around particular issues they're brought up there um, or particularly tricky patients we also use it to discuss the actual sort of model and issues that we're having with the model so that we can make um, changes to the processes quite easily um, and we went from having those meetings once a week they're now they're now every two weeks um, we also got approval from each of the contracting ccgs and that was both from the lead commissioners and also the quality leads within the CCG as well, just to check that they were happy with um, the safety and the quality of what we were offering. So um, in terms of challenges, obviously it was quite difficult to initially please everybody putting together sort of one service model across multiple different services. Um, whilst we have lots and lots of similarities with our services, there were some differences as well, you know, geographically. Um, but as much as possible, we wanted to keep to one model. Um, and that was also to provide cross cover. So some of our staff did get redeployed into, um, into more acute services. So we, because it's virtual, we did have the ability to be able to have service staff cross cover other services from other regions in the UK. So we needed to make sure that everybody knew how, how it worked. Um, there was early staff resistance to the change. I think any change that you get, you're going to get um, resistance as, as you transition through it. Um, but having best practice meetings really helped with that. And I think the biggest thing was around, you know, should or shouldn't we be doing observations? Um, there was also patient resistance to a virtual model early on. And I think that's because a lot of patients felt that this wasn't going to go on for very long, um, that maybe in a couple of months they would get their their program face to face. Um, we also have additional levels of cyber security that meant that some of the platforms we couldn't use where other people within the NHS might be able to. Um, we are still struggling with what to do with those who decline or aren't appropriate. You know, we recognize that there is a group there that are having to perhaps have just catch up calls to see how they're getting on so they're not forgotten about. <coughs> um, it's quite a lot of supporting information for patients. There's a lot more written stuff going out now. So we've had to be careful about checking literacy levels. Um, clinical productivity probably has dropped because it does take longer than doing face to face classes. It is less comprehensive as a program and you obviously lack that peer interaction and support for patients and also staff well-being. So they're working much more in isolation. Um, you know taking on a lot more things from patients at the moment so we've had to be quite mindful of that so um i'm going to hand over to michael now just to have a quick look at some of our data that we've we've captured from doing this just just to confirm siobhan can you hear me yes yeah perfect um so see so we wanted just to evaluate what it was we were doing and one of the, the thing of being quite a large organization with services all over the country is that we can get quite large data so we decided to do a bit of an evaluation and, and this is the halfway sort of results so hopefully the full results of uh, our time period will come out in sort of january time but in that period there was 461 patients who were contacted for the virtual program with just under half of them accepting the the virtual program um, and you can see the reasons there for uh, for not accepting so uh, largely um, sort of decline virtual um, or possibly decline pulmonary rehab altogether, which we know occurs um, in, in all rehab. Um, and then the sort of the, the, the graph down the bottom right there, this is what happened to those who came into the programme. And so of that 228, half the patients, um, again, just over another half of them actually completed. So that's 57 combining the uh, people who didn't make a discharge call 
Um, so essentially those who completed 75% of the program and for whatever reason weren't able to do a discharge session. Um, the, 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 the thing there is actually with all different services entering data, some patient or some um, data was entered that wasn't complete. So the no data there um, is going to be shared amongst the other reasons and they just haven't yet finished the course. Um, so therefore that could be a higher, a much higher than 57% completion, completion rate. Um, next slide. Is it coming? <laughs> there, okay. Um, so a bit smaller, but we're, <laughs> we'll have to do it like this. Um, so this is just some demographic data. Um, so of 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 the patients that we asked, um, what 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 were the demographics? And it was a a fairly normal split in terms of male to female, as we would expect. The average age is comparable to the average age of national audit. Um, but what you can see there is actually there's a the, the minimum age of patients is is a lot lower than we would normally get in face to face rehab. Um, and this is probably due to the remoteness of it, um, likely to do with our, our patients needing to shield and, and not being at work um, necessarily. Um, so it was good that we was able to target um, a younger uh, working audience as well. Um, you've got the table down the bottom left there with the uh, specific condition breakdown with the largest being COPD or COPD plus other respiratory condition um, and then you just got a sort of a comorbidity spread there with sort of most patients having between three to five um, comorbidities so again pretty reflective of, of what you'd normally see in in rehab oh, that's perfect so one of the things as part of the evaluation of our service we wanted to do is to see if there was a, a sort of a set of patients that would be more ideal to offer this program to. So we tried to compare um, some of the data. And actually, if you look at the group who um, weren't going forward onto the virtual program, demographically very similar in, in, in a lot of areas to the all group data. All of the, the things listed there, the scores were quite reflective. Um, it is just a descriptive data analysis. So we haven't done statistical analysis on this, um, partly because it was only the halfway report. So we just wanted to get a snapshot. Um, but a good thing there is actually with, with the group being so reflective of the entire population, actually the, the offering this um, to all patients is, is probably uh, sort of realistic and, 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 and acceptable. Next page. The biggest reasons for not sort of progressing onto the virtual program were um, almost 40% wanting face-to-face, -face, uh, and that's just a personal preference. And then the second biggest, as we introduced sort of those safety concern factors, was actually clinicians deciding that it wasn't the best platform for the patients. Um, so there was a, the main difference between the, the patients who... Um, didn't progress onto the virtual program versus the entire group was actually um, unable to use the internet. So that was quite a huge difference there. So there was 53% in, in, um, in this group who didn't pr proceed versus 30 in the entire group. Um, so again, we don't know the statistical relevance of this. Our, our, our program, as Siobhan said, wasn't even internet-based, but um, there's probably something there to say if you are uh, more um, happy sort of with the internet usage, your ability to be remote and, and do things um, more remotely is probably improved. Um, so the take home points there are sort of explained over the last couple of pages. So um, you can continue there. So then we've done the same thing for the completers. So was there a, a, a set of patients who are more likely to complete our virtual or remote program? Um, and again, they were really, really well matched on, on many different areas. Um, so there wasn't any sort of bias to certain demographics. 
Um, so uh, again, there, that's just the table there with the sort of percentage split of what, what, what happened with the patients. So if you imagine there, we've got 28% of patients with no data, we could spread that throughout and, and hopefully if, if half of that went to the completers, then actually we're in the 70s in terms of percentage completing, which is good. Um, and then skip forward. Oh. So the key differences for this group were, it was internet users were, were higher um, compared to the entire group. Um, their comorbidities, so there was a slight left shift in terms of slightly less comorbidities than the entire group. And also the MRC, there was more within the MRC2 score um, and therefore less within the others. Um, so potentially these are people who are going to complete the program remotely are, are potentially less um, disease burden, um, less comorbidities and, and higher or lower um, MRC scores. Um, so then just what did the data show? So sit to stand test was introduced. Um, so we know the MCID for this is, is a positive of three um, of which 67% of the completers met the MCID. And on average, the entire group had an improvement of six. So that's a, a good outcome there. Um, and that's the uh, sit to stand, next page. Just gonna rush through these slightly because I'm aware of time. The MCID for the, the CAT is, is a negative two. Um, and again, when we're looking at this, this here, we've got about 70% of the patients meeting the MCID for this score but the entire population of, of completers averaging at negative four. So again, it's a, it's a good change looking at the entire picture. Um, so obviously anxiety and depression are, are things that we're aware of with our patients, especially during these times. Um, so with this one, we eliminated any, any patients who had none on the score prior and post um, so that we could compare it um, to sort of what, what change occurred. Um, and what you can see is 55% um, met the MCID of a change in, in category. Um, and actually, when we look at the overall picture, 95% of our patients in terms of depression either stayed the same or improved. Um, so that's a good thing considering the uh, variability in, in the times. Similar picture with the GAD7. Um, so again, we're looking at a, a change in score here. And just under 50% met the MCID. Um, but what it meant is actually 91% of our patients either stayed the same or improved, which again is a really, really positive outcome. So summary here. Um, so we had a 50% uptake to the virtual or remote program with a 57% completion rate. If you added the 28% of those who, who didn't have data for that could be as high as 85. Um, the demographics suggest that it could be offered to all and there was no sort of sort of targeted approach and um, more of a patient preference approach. Um, and the main reasons for not attending was obviously patient um, clinician safety or patient preference. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there just in case anyone has any questions because I know we're meant to finish at half past. Um, but obviously that's all readable um, on, on, on playback. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Now, I'm just going to dive in deep with the questions. Um, this is one that comes up a lot as well. How are you managing the educational pro, um, component, for example, the dietetic, the pharmacy side of things and life? How, how do you do that? So I, th I think as I alluded to earlier, obviously, it's really hard to give a fully comprehensive educational programme. Um, over individual calls because um, our poor assistants who are delivering a lot of that um, could be repeating themselves numerous times a day um, as a starting point. So what we're tending to do is um, give sort of the most pertinent information that we feel those patients need. So it's a little bit more individualised. They're still getting um, kind of everything sent out in terms of literature around those topics. Um, often they're being asked to read stuff in advance um, so that we can have a, a more fruitful conversation with them on the next call. I think it's about being realistic, isn't it, um, in the content that's delivered as well and signposting. It's not going to be a perfect leg for leg. And I think you've really demonstrated the impact it can have. So well done. 
There's quite a few comments and questions about the patient disclaimer and the safety disclaimer. Now, there's some comments that have come through that it's not recommended by the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy. What I will just make a comment and say is that obviously it's important to remember or, you know, our professional bodies are not regulating bodies and anything they put out there is maybe just their guidance or opinion. So within individual services, <clears throat> when we talk about what we've done within individual services, it's very much risk managed and developed around that service. So, because a lot of people get confused thinking that like the CSP is a regulating body, but it's absolutely not it's a professional body. Do you want to answer that question, Aibu? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's more along the lines of, um, so if you were signposting patients to my COPD, just before they undertook the exercise sort of element within that, they would just sign up to really say that they're recognising that, um, you know, they're, they're exercising within their own limits and, and things like that. So it's, um, we're obviously still doing a, a clinical assessment with them and we're still making sure that they're, they're safe to proceed. Um, so I guess it's more about making sure that they've understood all of the safety information that we've sent out with them. So what we're asking them to say is that they've kind of read and understood things like that they must stop if they get new chest pain. And it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff around that. So perhaps stuff in class that we wouldn't necessarily say, we'd like you to sign to say that you, you, you know, are aware of all of those things. I think it's also a um, reminder clinician wise to make sure that they've actually read them because this is all sent in post, but at assessment, we need to read code in system one, tick the box to say they have read this. Um, so it's, it's more to remind, to make sure that safety from a clinician point of view, that it is being talked about and that these things are being read by patients and safety issues are being addressed. Thank you. And this is a really, there's still a lot of um, like hostility towards rehabilitation in COVID times. What's your advice for the clinicians out there that are really facing these barriers from other clinicians or managers about getting up, getting operational? What would, you, what would your take or message be to finish? I think that you, you have to put the patient first. You know, at the end of the day, um, we, we can work and overcome barriers and at the you know we know that there's so many patients at the moment who may suffer long term because usual services are not being delivered at the moment so I think there are means and ways around that you, you know you might have to think a bit laterally um, but there are definitely ways of delivering it and you know I hope what we come out with in the future is more of a menu based approach to rehab where actually you know we've proven that we could cater better for our younger um, working age sort of um, patients with with more remote offerings so um, I think it's just put the patient first when you're thinking. Thank you but, Michael uh, final quick yeah, comment. Yeah um, so I would say it, it, it's a it, the, the impact we have on patients is great if you looked at the outcomes and just the outcomes of that you would see that there's a benefit there so whatever it is you're trying to implement, it's that patient benefit at the end of the day. So I was skeptical personally and professionally about the efficacy of the program and whether it would actually cause a difference. And that's why you evaluate what you're doing and find results that are, are great. And you've demonstrated that beautifully. So um, I really want to thank you for your time today. You've been incredible. We do have a half an hour break, everyone. So please get yourself up, get yourself moving, get some fresh air, get active. Um, try and do switch off for half an hour. This is a long, long um, session today and we'll be back at 1pm for those that are watching live for the next